last year, I stood before you on Yom Kippur, and I spoke about my best friend, Rabbi Amy Urshe Jirasi, Zirchona Levracha. Her memory is a blessing. I spoke about her impending death and my own brokenness. I delivered a sermon I had practiced more than any sermon before. I had notes written all over every page, where to pause, how to change cadence, when to make eye contact, every sentence diagrammed. Why? Because if I did not prepare, I would have delivered the first sentence of the sermon and broken into tears. I practiced and I planned, but there was one very important thing I could not plan for. You, my community. Nothing could prepare me for the moment when I looked out and I witnessed all of your tears. Judaism teaches that tears are what opens the gates of heaven, where people who both value tears and are fluent in them. Because when we cry, God remembers us. But also when we cry, we remember who we are. Because when we cry, we remember what we care about. I'm telling you the story because I know some of the grief you carry, how it aches to arrive at Kol Nidre without the ones that you love by your side. I know that despite the profound differences between the islands of grief we each stand upon, we are intimately connected by the experience of loss. For me, and for perhaps you too, it's a friend, a kind of grief our tradition doesn't speak enough about. For some here, it's a parent, a partner, a sibling. For some, it's a child, ripped from you too soon. The absence of our loved ones is so painfully present. For all of us, it has been a year filled with grief and tears for the Jewish people. This year has broken us. Since October 7th, our world has radically changed. From last Kol Nidre to tonight, it is not the same world. I had hoped the cataclysmic shift would be felt by all, but I can only speak for our community from what you have shared with me. We are destabilized, disoriented. We are so far away, and yet we are connected. And so we come here tonight on Kol Nidre because we need this sanctuary to find ourselves again, to find one another, to be held in our grief, to place a hand over our wounded heart. It's both the experience of gathering for the high holidays and the themes of these days that bring us face to face with this grief. We say the book of life is open, and we know there are no guarantees. Our liturgy and our pleading, our dressing in white and fasting, our promises to live differently, to make the most of whatever time we have here on this planet. It's all the spiritual mirror and work of the season, and it's hard. Rabbi Sharon Brous, in her new book, The Amen Effect, teaches about a somewhat obscure text that has been my unlikely teacher for the past several months, as I, like so many of us, has felt as if we are drowning in an ocean of tears, sorrow, helplessness, and grief for ourselves, for the Jewish people, and for the world. Buried deep within the Mishnah, a Jewish legal compendium from around the third century, is an ancient practice reflecting a deep understanding of the human psyche and spirit. When your heart is broken, when tears are flowing, when the shadow of death visits your family, when you feel lost and alone and inclined to retreat, you show up. You entrust your pain to the community. The text, Midot Tutu, describes a pilgrimage ritual from the time of the Second Temple. Several times each year, Thousands of Jews would ascend to Jerusalem, the center of Jewish religious and political life. 
They would climb the steps of the Temple Mount and they would enter its enormous plaza, turning to the right, all together, circling counterclockwise. Meanwhile, the brokenhearted, the mourners, and here we can add the lonely and the sick, would make the same ritual walk, but they would turn to the left and circle in the opposite direction, every step against the current. And each person who encountered someone in pain would look into that person's eyes and inquire, what happened to you? Why does your heart ache? My father died, a person might say. Or perhaps my child is sick or my husband left. Those who walk from the right would offer a blessing. May the Holy One comfort you. You are not alone. And then they would continue to walk until the next person approached. What a profound ritual. This timeless wisdom speaks to what it means to be human in a world of pain. This year, you walk the path of the anguished. Perhaps next year, it will be me. I hold your broken heart, knowing that one day you will hold mine. I read in this text many profound lessons for when so many of us feel like we are breaking. First, do not take your broken heart and go home. Don't isolate. Step towards those whom you know will hold you tenderly. By happenstance of the calendar, the first time Amy's name was read aloud on the Kaddish list was the night of last year's Osirin lecture. I was sitting in the back of the temple, and when Rabbi Kahana read her name aloud, there was an audible gasp in the room. Many of you didn't know that Amy had died. It happened so fast after last Yom Kippur. But you knew her name. Tears rolled down my face as so many of you approached me. It was such a powerful moment of connection because I opened my heart. Because I walked in the opposite direction, you all offered me blessing. You are not alone. Often we think we save ourselves and others if we don't talk about our sadness. But our ancestors thought differently. They knew that talking about grief and loss is exactly what's going to help us move forward. This ancient temple ritual serves as a reminder that the world holds brokenness. And our daily work is to notice and integrate that loss, not deny or avoid it, but instead to be curious about what it might teach us. Stories and rituals connect us and also help us remember that it's okay to talk about loss. We can take the grief and the heartache with us as we begin the next chapters of our life. And there will be room for it all, the sadness, the joy, the absence and the presence. I told you last year about the Jurassi collection, how Amy told me to take her clothes and wear them. And I did just that. Amy had great style. Amy's clothes are a true outward manifestation of her love of fashion, color, and snark. I wear her clothes to weddings and on the bima. I wore her purple zebra striped jumpsuit to my son Max's bar mitzvah. I wear her sparkled kippah every time I lead services, even this evening. When I wear her clothes, people ask me about them. And with each encounter, I get to share more about Amy. You may say, I've cleaned up and put away anything that reminds me of the pain. But you have a picture, a quilt, a t-shirt, a ring, a piece of Judaica. Take it out. Now some of you might think, I can't take that out. That's too painful. People won't know what to say. It's better to keep it hidden. The rabbis say, take it out. There's a place for it all, not hidden away or suppressed or whispered about so children won't see. In fact, showing our children that we grieve teaches them how to grieve when an inevitable loss comes. We welcome it into the room, and more often than not, we find that integrating grief and loss 
strengthens our connections with others. They are gentle and enduring reminders for us to consider. In the wake of loss, how will we choose to live? Sitting here tonight, we may be asking the same questions. We have to believe these memories will help us create enduring and meaningful next chapters in our lives if we bring them with us. And this is done in connection to the memory, not apart from it. We don't get over our grief and then feel ready to move on. Even when someone has apologized for hurting us, we still feel tender. We carry our pain with us. But do we remember to honor what we've lived through, where we've come from? What might it look like and sound like to bring forth those memories? Even as you worry, they will make you too sad. Because for so many who grieve after the funeral, the divorce or separation, the painful goodbye, after the public post on social media that initially receives a wellspring of consolation, it gets too quiet. We think we save ourselves and others if we don't talk about the sadness. But isn't that on a certain level what it means to mourn, to remember the hurt, to hold on to the pain, to know that try as you may, you will never transcend loss, but you must nevertheless find a way to put one foot ahead of the other. And on your good days, the days when you can breathe, you show up then too. It's an expression of both love and sacred responsibility to turn to another person in her moment of deepest anguish and say, your sorrow may scare me, it may unsettle me, but I will not abandon you. I will meet your grief with relentless love. I want to remind you of another important story from the rabbis of the Talmud. One I quote often because it teaches us something so powerful. The rabbis tell us that when Moses hurled the original tablets of the law to the ground in anger, breaking them into thousands of pieces, the Israelites picked up the pieces of the broken tablets and put them in the holy ark. No shard left behind. The shards became the foundation of the new tablets. The Israelites remembered the hurt and held on to the pain, even as they put one foot ahead of the other. They carried the shards step by step to the promised land. Yom Kippur helps us to live with our brokenness and to know with confidence that it is not only possible to rebuild after disappointment and loss, but that often the new construction is stronger and that the strength of our build will come from our willingness to be in the mess not separate ourselves from it, for showing up and integrating the loss and learning from it, not by ignoring it. We cannot magically fix one another's broken hearts, but we can find each other in our most vulnerable moments and wrap each other up in a circle of care. We can humbly promise each other, I can't take your pain away, but I can promise you won't have to hold it alone. Amy's oldest child, Carson, turned nine in August. Last year, his eighth birthday was celebrated in Manzanita, the last trip Amy and the kids took together. This year of firsts has been painful, and I was particularly dreading Carson's birthday. For me, Carson's eighth birthday was the last normal picture I have of me and Amy, and the last series of cogent conversations. This was the trip where we spoke about turning her ashes into diamonds. Yes, this is a real business. And when she told me I was officiating her funeral alongside our classmate and dear friend Matt, and she reminded me I had no say in the matter. Here we are, a year later, and I didn't want to bring my overwhelming sadness to this nine-year-old child. And then I got a text from Carson's dad that for his birthday, he wanted to FaceTime with all his friends, and I am one of his friends. Carson and I FaceTimed. We talked about Oregon and how he wants to come back and stay at my house and play with my kids. He loves it when I come to visit him in Los Angeles, but he wants to come back here. 
a place of connection to memories of his mom and his mom's best friend. I promised him we'd make it happen. Small, tender gestures remind us that we are not helpless, even in the face of grave human suffering. We maintain the ability, even in the dark of night, to find our way to one another. Like the ancient rabbis, we need to create a ritual of connection that will help us integrate unprecedented and unfathomable loss. We need to see one another in our pain. We need to have faith that we can create something beautiful out of our brokenness. Rabbi Brouse argues that we desperately need a spiritual rewiring in our time. Imagining a society in which we learn to see one another in our pain, to ask one another, what happened to you? Imagine that we hear one another's stories, meet one another's tears, and even pray for one another's healing. She calls this the amen effect, sincere, tender encounters that help us forge new spiritual and neuro pathways by reminding us that our lives and our destinies are entwined. Because ultimately, it's only by finding our way to one another that we will begin to heal. Writing this sermon, writing last year's sermon, was hard. It was painful to anticipate sharing my grief. But your caring over this year Show me how important it is to share our grief. How important it is to comfort one another. How important it is to show up. How important it is to walk against the current and be met with blessings. Grief is not something we have to endure alone. It's something that we hold together as a community. We comfort one another. We show up for one another. This is not just a personal responsibility. This is not just about me, your rabbi. It's communal. It's about us. On this Yom Kippur, let us not be afraid to carry our grief together, being present to it and sharing it with others. Let us show up and build real communities of care and foster deep connections. You are not alone. We are are not alone. Just as we are held up in our weariness, may we come together to hold up the weary. Just as we need to be comforted and heal our broken hearts, may we comfort others and heal their broken hearts. And just as we desperately need to be uplifted, so may we lift up those in need. This is what true sacred community is all about. This is what Congregation Beth Israel stands for. A sanctuary of love, support, hope, and healing. Gemar Chatimatova. May you be sealed for a good year. Amen.